Let's go on to section 3.3 about measures of variability. The ones we'll talk about are the range. The range is just the largest value minus the smallest value in the data set. The standard deviation is an average of how far the data values are from the mean. And the variance is just the square of the standard deviation. So the range is easy to find. The standard deviation is a little bit harder, so we're going to talk more about that one. So the standard deviation measures the variation of values around the mean. Here's a shortcut formula for the standard deviation. This is why I'm going to ask you to use StatCrunch or your calculator or something else to find the standard deviation because this formula is hard to remember and takes quite a while to calculate. It doesn't look much like a shortcut even though it is. So don't worry about learning this formula. We will be using technology such as StatCrunch or a calculator instead of trying to use this formula and calculate the standard deviation by hand. If you have a TI calculator and you'd like to know how to use it to find the mean and the standard deviation, there's a nice video that shows you how to do this, which is out on the class website on ANGEL. And I would highly recommend that you watch this video. If you do have a TI calculator, it's so much easier to find the standard deviation by using your TI calculator. Another way you can do this is by using StatCrunch. When you do your homework for Chapter 3, you'll be able to use that StatCrunch button to the right in your homework assignment. And if you do Tech Assignment 3, it does go through and it actually shows you how to use StatCrunch for this. So again, I would highly recommend that you go ahead and do that Tech Assignment so that you know how to use StatCrunch because I really don't want you to spend a lot of time trying to use this formula and do this by hand. It's much more important for the standard deviation that you understand what it means in terms of the data. So again, the standard deviation is a measure of variation of all the data values from the mean. It's a type of average of how far the data values are from the mean. One thing about the standard deviation is that if we have outliers in the data, in other words, data values that are far away from all the others, this can affect the standard deviation quite a bit. And if we have an outlier, it's always going to increase the standard deviation. The nice thing about the standard deviation is that the units for the standard deviation are the same as the units of the original data value. For example, if our original data values were money amounts, so dollars, then the units for our standard deviation would also be dollars. Now here's an example of comparing two data sets using the standard deviation. And these two displays were both created by StatCrunch. And notice all the values that StatCrunch gives you without you having to do very much work. So this is a comparison of two branches of a bank one where customers wait in individual lines at three different teller windows, and another one where all the customers enter a single waiting line and go to the first available teller. So here are the column statistics from StatCrunch for the two branches. The first branch is the one where customers wait in individual lines at each of the teller windows. So if we look here at the mean and the standard deviation, our other me measure of variability that we can look at is the range. So let's also pay attention to that one. For the second branch, this is where all the customers enter a single waiting line and just go to the first available teller. So here's our mean, our standard deviation, and our range. So if we look at our two means, they're both very close to 5.3. So that doesn't really tell us much about how the data sets are different. If we look at the standard deviations, though, notice that the standard deviation for the first set is much larger than the standard deviation for the second set. And it's the same with the range. The range for the first set is almost twice the range of the second set. So this tells us that for the first branch, there's much more variation in the data values than there are for the second branch. Another way to think about this is for the first branch, the data values are much more spread out. We can also think about this from the range, since the range is the largest value minus the smallest value. And notice here it even gives us the minimum and maximum data values. 
So look at what we have here. In this case, the waiting time for the first branch go from 2.1 up to almost 10 minutes. For the second branch, we only go from 3.5 up to about 7 minutes. The idea here is that the standard deviation being larger for the first branch means that the waiting times aren't as consistent. If you go to that branch, you might only have to wait two minutes, but on the other hand, you might have to wait almost 10 minutes. If you go to the second branch, your waiting times are going to be much more consistent. Here's another way that we could look at these two data sets. Here we have histograms of the two sets of waiting times. So this first one is for branch one, and notice how the data values are very spread out. We start down here with about two minutes and go all the way up to 10 minutes and got lots of spread out data values in between. On the other hand, for the second branch, our data values are much closer together. They're grouped much more closely around the mean. So just looking at these two histograms, we could make an educated guess that the standard deviation for branch number one would be larger than the standard deviation for branch number two, just because the data values are more spread out. Now we also have something called the range rule of thumb, and this is a way to relate the range and the standard deviation. And this is based on the fact that a lot of data sets, the majority of the data values, or about 95%, are within two standard deviations of the mean. One of the things that we can do with this we can make an informal definition for usual and unusual values. So we can say that our usual values are within two standard deviations of the mean. So if we have a data set and we know the mean and the standard deviation, then we can say the minimum usual value is the mean minus two times the standard deviation. And the maximum usual value is the mean plus two times the standard deviation. And that means that unusual values are outside of these two limits. We can also use the range rule of thumb to estimate the standard deviation if we can't calculate it for some reason. So to get a rough estimate of the standard deviation, then we can just take the range and divide by four. And remember, the range is just the maximum data value minus the minimum data value. Now, some properties of the standard deviation. As we said, for many data sets, a value is unusual if it differs from the mean by more than two standard deviations, if it's more than two standard deviations away from the mean. Now, another thing to watch out for is that we should really only compare standard deviations of two different data sets if they have the same scale and if they use the same units and if they have means that are close to being the same. Now the empirical rule says that if we have a data set that's approximately normal or approximately bell-shaped, we have these properties. About 68% of the values fall within one standard deviation of the mean. About 95% of the values fall within two standard deviations of the mean. About 99.7% of all values fall within three standard deviations of the mean. So here's a picture of the empirical rule. Now again, this one really only applies if we have an approximately bell-shaped distribution. So notice that this distribution starts with low frequencies on the left end, goes up to a high point in the middle, and then the frequencies go back down. And notice that it's symmetric on either side of the center. So if we have this type of distribution, then we have our mean here in the middle. And then we're looking at going one standard deviation on either side of that. And if we look at that area between those two points, 
we're going to have 68% of the data values in that area. And since this is symmetric, we can even split it up into the two halves. So we'd have 34% on each side. Now, if we do the same thing, only going two standard deviations from the mean. So here's our mean. So we go two standard deviations this way, two standard deviations this way. Then in between these two points, we have 95% of the data values. And again, we can split this up into halves because it's symmetric on either side of our mean. And that means that we'd have 47.5% on each side. And finally, if we go three standard deviations on either side, so this is three standard deviations, and this is three standard deviations. Then in between those two points, we have almost all of the data, 99.7%. And again, it's symmetric, so if we took 99.7% and divided it by two, we'd have that much on either side of this. Now, one other thing we can talk about that has to do with the mean and the standard deviation. If we do want to compare two data sets that have different means or different standard deviations, we can use something called the coefficient of variation. And this describes how our standard deviation relates to the mean. So if we have a sample, and this is just notation, then our coefficient of variation is standard deviation divided by the mean. So the S stands for standard deviation, and the X with the bar stands for the mean. And then we take this times 100% to put it in percentage form. If we have a population, then our notation is just different. This still stands for the standard deviation, and this still stands for the mean. So this is the same formula, just with different notation. Section 3.4 is about measures of relative standing and box plots. When we talk about relative standing, that means the location of data values relative to the other values within a data set. So we can use these to compare values from different data sets or even to compare values within the same data set. The most important measure of relative standing we're going to talk about is the z-score. But we'll also discuss percentiles and quartiles, and we'll talk about a new statistical graph that we haven't looked at before, which is called a box plot. Some different measures of relative standing are the z-score. The z-score is just the number of standard deviations a value is above or below the mean. A percentile is the percentage of values less than a specific value. And a quartile is a specific kind of percentile. And this gives us a boundary for the lowest 25% or the highest 25% of the data values. First, let's talk about z-scores. Again, a z-score is the number of standard deviations that a given value x is above or below the mean. If x is above the mean, then the z-score is going to be positive. If it's below the mean, the z-score is going to be negative. So here are what our range of z-scores looks like. If our value x is the same as the mean, then our z-score will be 0. If our value x is one standard deviation more than the mean, then the z-score would be 1. If it's one less than the mean, then our z-score would be negative 1. And remember what we talked about with usual and unusual values? Our usual values are going to be within two standard deviations of the mean, which means that the z-scores are going to be between negative 2 and positive 2. And our unusual values are going to be outside of that range. So they're going to have z-scores that are either less than negative 2 or greater than positive 2. So to find the z-score, we have two different formulas here just because the notation is different if we have a sampler or a population. This is our specific data value, that's x. The x bar is the mean, and the s is the standard deviation. Now, if we have a population, then our notation is a little bit different. So instead of the x bar and the s, we have the mu and the sigma. So the x still stands for our data value, 
the mu is our mean, and the sigma is our standard deviation. And usually we round these scores to two decimal places. Here's an example of finding these scores and comparing them. So we have an industrial psychologist who develops two different tests to measure job satisfaction. The question is, which score is better? In other words, which score has better relative standing? A score of 72 on the management test, which has a mean of 80 and a standard deviation of 12, or a score of 19 on the test for production employees, which has a mean of 20 and a standard deviation of 5. The point is here, you can't judge the scores just by the numbers because we have two totally different tests with two totally different scoring techniques. So what we want to do is find the position of each score relative to that particular test's mean and standard deviation. For our management test score, we want to find the z-score for the 72. The 72 would be our x, and our mean was 80, our standard deviation was 12. So we're taking 72 minus 80, which would be negative 8, dividing that by 12, which gives us a negative 0.67. Now for the production employee's test score, our z-score would be the 19, which again is the x, our mean was 20, and our standard deviation was 5. So if we take 19 minus 20, we get negative 1, divided by 5 gives us a negative 0.2. The question was, which one of these two scores has a better relative standing? A better relative standing when we're talking about z-scores is just whether we have a higher z-score. And if we look at these two values, since they're both negative, actually the negative 0.2 is a greater value than the negative 0.67. So that means that this one corresponds to the score with the better relative standing. So that tells us that the production employees test score has better relative standing. In the last section, we mentioned outliers. An outlier is a value that lies far away from the mass, vast majority of the other values in a data set. And we did say that an outlier can have a dramatic effect on the mean, can also have a dramatic effect on the standard deviation. Now for the mean, an outlier can either increase or decrease the mean. But for the standard deviation, if we have an outlier, the effect is always going to be to increase the standard deviation. An outlier can also affect a histogram by affecting the scale of the histogram, and this can cause the true nature of the distribution to be obscured. One way we can define an outlier is by looking at the z-scores. And as we've been talking about in this textbook, an outlier defined by a z-score must be more than two standard deviations away from the mean. And the book calls this an unusual value. So if we have a data value with a z-score of less than negative 2 or greater than 2, we would consider that data value to be an outlier. And again, for our minimum and maximum usual values, these are two standard deviations below or above the mean. Here's an example. 
The weekly sales for a company are $10,000 with a standard deviation of $450. Sales for the past week were $9,050. We want to know whether this value of $9,050 is unusually high, unusually low, or just about right. So we're talking about usual and unusual values. So we're going to assume here that the $10,000 is the mean, and then we have our standard deviation of 450. So the 9,050 is our X. And remember, our Z-score formula is X minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So that's going to be 9,050 minus 10,000 divided by 450. Remember when you're using this formula, you have to do the subtraction on the top first before you do the division. So if we subtract 10,000 from 9,050, we would get a negative 950. I'm going to divide that by 450. That's going to give us a value of negative 2.11. And remember, we said that we round these scores to two decimal places usually. So here's our z-score. Since this is actually less than negative 2, that means that our x value is an unusual value. In our choices here, we can pick either unusually high or unusually low. And since this came out to be negative, that means that this would be unusually low. So the correct answer for this one would be that this value is unusually low. Now let's talk about percentiles. Percentiles are measures of location in a data set. There are actually 99 percentiles in a data set, and the notation we use for this are P for percentile, P sub 1, P sub 2, and so on. And the number that's the subscript tells you which percentile it is. So P sub 1 would be the first percentile, P sub 40 would be the 40th percentile, and so on. Now to find percentile, if we have a data value X and we want to know what percentile it's at, we would first find the number of values less than that value in our data set. So the number of values less than x, we would divide that by the total number of values. That gives us a decimal value. Then we would multiply that by 100 to get a percentage. And then we're going to round this to the nearest whole number. Here's an example. Here we have a list of the durations and hours of a random sample of all flights of a space shuttle program. And we want to find the percentile for the value 191 in the data set. So we're looking at this value, and we want to know what percentile that's at. So first, it would help to put the list in order from smallest to greatest, because the first thing we'll need to know is how many values are less than the 191. So if we put these in order, then here's our sorted list. Here's our 191. So we can count how many values are less than that. There are four. And since we have a total of 15 values in this list, then using our formula up here, we would take 4 divided by 15, multiply that by 100, and that gives us 26.7. We're going to round that to the nearest whole number, which is 27. And that means that the 191 is at the 27th percentile in this data set. Now, if we want to go the opposite way, if we have a set of data and we want to know which data value is at a certain percentile, then here's what we do. Again, we sort the data from smallest to largest. And then we have to calculate what we call the index. And this tells us the position of the data value. So for whatever percentile we want, we take that value, divide it by 100, and then we multiply by n, which is the number of data values in the set. Now, if the answer we get is not an integer, in other words, not a whole number, then we round up 
and this gives us the position in the sorted list of our percentile. If the index i does turn out to be an integer, then we find our specific percentile by averaging the data values in two positions, the i-th position and the i plus first position. This is much easier to see if we do an example. So again, we have the list of durations of the flights, and we're trying to find the 75th percentile for this data. So we want to know what data value is at the 75th percentile. So again, we're going to start by sorting the data, and then we're going to calculate our index i. And to do that, we look at which percentile we want, which is 75. So we take 75 and divide by 100. We multiply that by the number of values in the data set, which was 15. If we do this, we get 11.25. Now because 11.25 is not an integer, then we're going to round up to the next integer. And for this particular type of problem, we're always going to round up. So if we round up to the next integer, which is 12, that tells us that our 75th percentile is the value that's in the 12th position in the list. So when we're calculating this index, the index is the position in the list of the data value. And if we look at our sorted list of data again, if we count over 12, the value in the 12th position is the 266. So our 75th percentile for this data is 266. Let's look at another example. In this one, we have a data set with a range of 55.1 to 102.8 and 300 observations, meaning that there are 300 data values. So observations here is the same as data values. And in this case, this tells us that there are 207 data points with values less than 88.6. And we want to find the percentile or the value 88.6. So in this one, actually, it gives us all the information that we need because it tells us how many values are less than the 88.6. And remember, our formula was that we take the number of values less than our value. We divide that by the total number of values. And then we multiply that by 100. So that means we're going to take our 207, because that's how many values were less than the 88.6. We're going to divide that by 300, because there were a total of 300 data values and then we're going to multiply that answer by 100. 207 divided by 300 gives us 0.69. So if we multiply that by 100, we get 69. So that's our percentile for the 88.6. Now quartiles are just a special type of percentile. The first quartile is the same as the 25th percentile. The second quartile is the same as the 50th percentile. And this is actually the same as the median. And the third quartile is the same as the 75th percentile. And when we're doing a five number summary, this consists of five values. The minimum data value, the first quartile, the median, which is the same as the second quartile, the third quartile, and the maximum data value. The reason we talk about five number summaries is that we use those to do box plots. A box plot is just a graph of a data set that has a box with lines drawn at the first quartile, the median, and the third quartile. The length of the whispers, which are lines that extend on either side of the box, depends on which textbook or software you're using. In this textbook, for a box plot, 
the whiskers extend to the minimum value on one side and the maximum value on the other side of the box. So here's what a box plot would look like. Notice that these five numbers are our five number summary. We've got a minimum and a maximum and that's how far our whiskers extend or out to the minimum and to the maximum. And the actual box part of the box plot goes from the first quartile to the third quartile and it has a line in the middle that represents the median. Now you can tell something about a distribution from looking at the box plot. If we have a set of data that's normally distributed, then the box plot is going to look fairly symmetric. So for one thing, the median is going to be right in the middle of the box, not off to one side or the other. And the whiskers should extend about the same distance in either direction from the box. If we have a skewed distribution, then that means that our box can be further on one side or the other. And also, if you look at where the median is in the box, it's probably not going to be in exactly the middle of the box, but it's going to be further towards one side or the other of the box. So here are a couple of other box plots that would represent skewed distribution. Notice in this one, the median would be further to the left in the box, and also the whiskers aren't the same length. The one on the right side is shorter than the one on the left. And in this box plot down here, our median is actually further to the right side of the box, although the whiskers are closer to being the same length. Now for modified box plots, this is just a different representation of box plots that you see in some software. In this, we consider outliers to be data values that meet specific criteria. And for a box plot, we'd consider an, a data value to be an outlier if it's above the third quartile by an amount greater than 1.5 times the IQR. And the IQR is the Q3 value minus the Q1 value. So it can be above Q3 by one and a half times the IQR, or it can be below the first quartile by an amount greater than one and a half times the IQR. And if we have a modified box plot, then the whiskers don't go out to the minimum and maximum data values. In this case, we use a special symbol like an asterisk or a cross to identify outliers. For modified box plots, the whiskers only go as far as our limits for the outliers. Here's an example of a modified box plot. And this is just so that if you see one, you'll understand what this means. So in this box plot, we have our whiskers. Notice they don't go out to the maximum data value. And the two dots on the right side of this box plot mean that there are actually two outliers. 